So on April 8th, 1911, Heike Kammerling Onne made a historic discovery. So he was looking at the, the conductivity of mercury at really low temperatures. And he saw that as the temperature dropped, the, the resistance decreased. But then at 4.2 degrees above the absolute minus, something remarkable happened. So the resistance disappeared. So he couldn't believe his eyes. He rewired the experiment, did it all over again, and found the exactly same thing. At 4.2 degrees above the absolute minus, all resistance disappeared. So he had, conduct, he had discovered superconductivity. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, is how science works. Right? You, you made an, um, an observation of something uh, strange and outrageous behavior. You made some hypothesis about why the world is reacting like that. You tried them out, and you learned something new about the world. As uh, Max Planck said, that uh, experiment is the only true way to knowledge. All else is poetry, fantasy. So, uh, let me get the clicker. So what about kids? Do, do they also know that that's the way you conduct science? Uh, so, these are my kids. Uh, not the one in the middle, but the other two are my kids. <laughs> and uh, they do crazy stuff. Uh, and most of the times it seems pretty random. But do they actually have like a system that allows them to navigate in this overwhelming uh, information that's uh, thrown at them every day? Do they know how to derive knowledge from that? Do they know when to learn something and when to ignore that? So I will take you through an experiment that they made at the John Hopkins University. They looked at 11-month 11 uh, 11 infants and saw that the infants used the violations of the prior expectations as an opportunity for learning. Violations of prior expectations as opportunity for learning. So what does that mean? So the infants were shown events, different events. And when the events sort of violated the expectations of how they would think that the object would behave, they used that as a learning, uh, learning moment. So in one of the experiments, they put a baby in front of uh, this slate. They put up two purple walls and hid them with like a gray screen. Next, they rolled the bowl down the ramp. And in some instances, they let the ball, when they took away the screen, it seemed like it had passed through the first purple wall. And in some instances, they just let it stay where it was supposed to before the first wall. So what they realized afterwards, they gave the kids the opportunity to play around with the toys. And in the instances where the, the ball sort of violated the, the expected uh, outcome, the kids were much more interested about you know, examining the object, seeing not only did they play with it more, but they also tried to understand it. So when it violated this uh, laws of physics, they tried to bang it against the table and see if it was really massive. So, so it seems that kids, even at, at this early stage, have a system for when they see something that's not expected, they made some kind of hypothesis, tried them out, and learned something about the world. Does this sound familiar? That's how science works, right? That's what we said. You have an unexpected behavior, you make a hypothesis, you try them out, and you learn something new about the world. So what can we do to keep kids being, keeping that knowledge? You know? staying excited, doing experiments, coming up with the stuff like Heike Kammerling or like Kiran, you know, being inspired and trying out new stuff. So we at Google, uh, we have science at the core of our company DNA. So our company was really started as a science experiment in a garage. Uh, so everybody in the company is really passionate about this. And 
we asked them what they wanted to do to inspire kids. And a lot of our employees, they had uh, been at science fairs in their schools. But could we re rethink that sort of uh, science fair concept, make it available to everybody, bring it online, make a new start for that? So we started Google Science Fair. And uh, this is the fifth year that we're doing it. And I'm going to show you the call out video for this year's contest. Scientists, technologists, innovators, they're just like you. They love trying things, uncertain things, ambitious things, things that sound as crazy in our heads as they do out loud. Those are the things that make us get up, brush our teeth, and go risk our reputation on a hunch. Trying something new is the only way to make the next great whatever. And the best part is, we all know how to do it. When you were a baby, you unsuccessfully tried that new walking thing for like four months. And now you walk like a champion. Same with talking, swimming, riding a bike. The desire to try new things is built into you. Now take that desire, apply some science, and get ready to change the world. From Earth's brightest builders to her bravest explorers. Every accomplishment, every accolade, every bit of this round of applause started with a love of trying things. Drebel tried submarines. Lovelace tried algorithms. But now, it's your turn. What will you try? So today, Google Science Fair is the world's largest science fair. It targets uh, kids between 13 and 18, and uh, we've uh, translated it to 14 languages. And you can also compete with people from uh, different parts of the world in a team. So, We've developed some course materials so teachers can uh, adopt this and put it into the school curriculum in the countries where maybe science fair isn't as common as it is in the US. And we arranged some, we call it hangout on airs. So you can connect yourself and ask your questions to a lot of scientists or just be inspired by the, by the work they have done. And the competition has regional finals. And then we take 20 finalists to, I hope to see you there, Kieran. Uh, <laughs> We take 20 finalists to the Google headquarters uh, in, in Mountain View, and uh, they get to present their project to the public and to a esteemed panel of judges. We have people from Virgin Galactic, the spaceship, and National Geographic, and a lot of you know, really uh, inspiring crowd that they can uh, meet there. Nobel lecturers and our own boss of uh, innovation, Astro Teller. So, and the products that make the final cuts, they are really, they are really amazing. So, so, uh, one is a 16-year-old girl called Elif from Turkey. So she found a way to uh, turn ba banana peel to non-decayable bioplastic. That's mind-blowing. I don't understand half of it. She managed to do that. There was another girl called Shri Bose from, from Texas that uh, did research on a uh, chemo drug called uh, cisplatin, which is commonly used against ovarian cancer, but it has a side effect that, that you can uh, grow resistance to this. She started looking into that, and her results have been acknowledged by the research community. So that not only gave her the, the grand prize of uh, $50,000 in a research scholarship, but also a trip to the Galapagos Island with National Geographic and uh, to the CERN laboratory. So I'll take you to my favorite, uh, which is uh, Mihir, a 15-year-old guy from uh, Pittsburgh. And he was fascinated in advanced robotics, and he studied fruit flies, you know, the annoying things that gather around fruit, and their sort of response mechanism to, to, to fear or avoid a, a fear object, and uh, turned ad into advanced rob robotics. So I'll roll the tape for you. My name is Mihir. I'm 15 years old, and I'm a sophomore at Fox Chapel Area High School in Pittsburgh. I started visiting the Carnegie Science Center from an early age. It's full of fun and interactive exhibits, which helped spark my interest in science and develop a love for robotics. Last summer, my family and I went to India on vacation. We returned to find our house filled with fruit flies, as we had left some bananas on the kitchen counter. After many failed attempts trying to swat them, I started to realize how amazing the fruit flies escape is. I had been reading about flying robots at the time, and one thing that struck me was the similarities in the environments in which both fruit flies and flying robots have to operate. 
I wanted to see whether we could draw from biology to make flying robots truly autonomous, so they could potentially be used in robot-assisted rescue missions in environments like collapsed buildings. So the hard work began. I designed a lightweight sensor module to estimate the position and orientation of an approaching threat, drawing inspiration from the Fruitfly's rudimentary but fast visual system. I spent the first six months experimenting with different sensors and circuitry, building and testing prototypes, and coding to tie everything together. During the last stage of my research, I spent most of my time creating algorithms. I wanted to apply my learnings from Fruitfly escape behaviors to a multi-rotor helicopter. I used a sheet of plywood to simulate an approaching threat while testing different algorithms. And I was really excited when my robot managed to escape with a success rate of 100% across 20 attempts. Finally, I compared still imagery from my robot's escape to high-speed images of fruit flies and found that despite my multi-rotor helicopter having limited knowledge of the threat and little processing power, its behavior was really similar to what I was trying to mimic. I'm really optimistic about the world of tomorrow. I want to save lives with flying robots and use computer science and robotics to make a difference. This is a world that I'd like to be a part of, but more importantly, one that I'd like to help create. That's mind-blowing, right? Yep. So, fantastic project. Uh, and at Google, we're also obsessed with the way that technology can change the world, can make it a little easier or better or more comfortable. And uh, our, one of our founders, Larry Page, often says that we should have like a healthy disregard for the, the impossible. So take on problems that seem impossible that you can't really do something about. And we have uh, a couple of those in our moonshot factory that we call Google X. So I'm going to take you through two of those examples. So one is transportation or getting around. So that's obviously one of the most important things for us humans to do. And the car is you know, the symbol of ultimate freedom. You can go anywhere. But there's a big drawback about this that we talked about, the, the amount of people getting killed in car accidents. So 1.2 million people around the globe get killed every year in car accidents. And most of those uh, are the human error to blame. So it's humans who are causing those accidents. So what if you could still have that transportation and getting around, you know, save easy way, but take the humans out of the equation and make it more safe and enjoyable? So these cars have been driving around in California for, for many years and tens of thousands of miles. And uh, uh, the latest estimate that they will uh, you know, hit the streets or whatever you say uh, in 2020. Uh, I find this highly exciting and uh, you know, looking forward to getting in one of those. Another huge problem that we're uh, trying to tackle is uh, connectivity. So you usually see the, the internet community as a global one, but actually only one third of the world's population are online and two thirds are not. So we've uh, developed this project called Project Loon and it's about providing connectivity to remote areas or rural areas or, or bringing uh, uh, online access back after disasters. So it's a... Uh, mesh of uh, high altitude balloon that fly on the edge uh, of space and you control them by pulling them up and down so they can use the, the, the winds and the currents to cover large areas with online connectivity. So I think that's you know, part of the solution of uh, helping the, the next uh, five billion getting online. So what's the next challenge? Well, nobody knows, but I think what we illustrated with this example and what's really important to uh, keep kids and young adults uh, you know, interested and excited about continuing to experiment and ask those kind of uh, you know, silly questions, having a healthy disregard for the impossible. Because I think if you have a big idea, put some uh, science to it, experiment, uh, you can do anything. You can change the world. And uh, it's their time to change the world now. Thank you very much.